Tonight, Amazon's going to open a real-life store. Lenovo unveils a slew of new tablets that bend and stretch. And will the U.S. spine scandals break the Internet? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 190 for Thursday, October 9th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting, wholesome snacks right to your door. Forget the vending machine and start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like golden apple tea biscuits. Ooh, those are new. New to me anyway. To get your free NatureBox sampler box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Hey, so everybody, who wants to go to the Amazon store? You actually can. The retail giant has announced plans to open its first brick-and-mortar store. This is at least according to sources speaking to the Wall Street Journal. The store is reportedly set to open in time for the holiday shopping season. It'll be adjacent to the Empire State Building in New York City. It's a pretty good retail spot. And is uh, sort of an experiment by Amazon, not only to connect with customers in real life, but offer the instant availability of goods in a traditional store. The Amazon store would be kind of more of a warehouse than a true shop with limited inventory for same-day delivery within New York, product returns and exchanges, and pickups of online orders. The journal also reports that Amazon may use the space to showcase devices like Kindle e-readers, Fire smartphones, or Fire TV set-top boxes. Earlier today in London, Lenovo announced three new devices, a new convertible yoga laptop and two new yoga tablet models. Let's start with the tablets. The Yoga Tablet 2 Pro is 13.3 inches, has 32 gigabytes of space, runs Android, has a built-in projector that can beam 16 to 9 uh, high-resolution images or movies directly onto a wall or a screen of some kind, an integrated 8-watt sound system, and even a subwoofer. The Yoga 2 Pro also has has a 2560 by 1440 screen. That's actually quad HD. Uh, eight megapixel rear camera offers 15 hours of battery life and more. Suggested retail price is $499 and 4G will be an optional extra, at least in certain markets. The lower end Yoga Tablet 2, not the to Pro, the Tablet 2. Yeah, I got that right. Ships in 8 inches or 10 inch models and will run either Android for $299 or Windows for $399. Hmm. Lenovo is also introducing a fourth holding mode beyond hold or tilt or stand. It's kind of what the yoga line is known for. This one is called Hang, as in hang your yoga tablet on a platform to display content. What can't it do? Finally, the third uh, in what was announced today, the 13-inch Yoga 3 Pro joins Lenovo's existing line of convertible laptops. It also has that quad HD screen, 3200 by 1800 Gorilla Glass screen, and an Intel Core M processor. It's priced at $1,349 and comes in clementine orange, platinum silver, or champagne gold. Hmm, everybody loves gold these days. The Yoga 3 Pro promises 19 hours, no, not 19, nine. That didn't sound right in my head. Hours of battery life and is expected to go on sale later in October. Activist investor Carl Icahn wrote an open letter to Apple and Apple CEO Tim Cook uh, asking Apple to accelerate its stock repurchase because he thinks the stock is undervalued and about to grow exponentially and that Apple should be buying now. Well, Apple has replied. The company said, quote, we always appreciate hearing from our shareholders. Since 2013, we've been aggressively executing the largest capital return program in corporate history. And we've said before, we will review the program annually and take into account the input from all our shareholders. Apple included a table, sort of a little, little graph here, which shows that Apple has been aggressive with its share buyback program, returning $74 billion to shareholders and plans to return $130 billion to shareholders by the end of next year. Speaking of Apple, the company has confirmed its iPad event. Well, it's confirmed an event. Everyone knows it's going to be the iPad event next Thursday, October 16th. But sources tell the Wall Street Journal that suppliers have pushed back plans to mass produce a larger screen tablet to early next year from the beginning of December. Why? Because apparently the supply chain is tied up with new iPhones that are high enough in demand that, well, 
The companies just don't have time to do both. The output of the 5.5-inch iPhone 6 Plus remains unsatisfactory. That's according to one person at a supplier. And that it would be challenging for display makers to split resources and spend a few months to wrap up production for new larger screen iPads now. Suppliers in Asia say that Apple's larger tablet will likely have a 12.9-inch liquid crystal display screen with resolution that's similar to the iPad Air. That's the 9.7-inch model that was unveiled veiled in October of last year. So we are ripe for something new. But I don't know if we're going to get it for the holidays. Unit sales of iPads have fallen for two straight quarters, while revenue for tablets has fallen on a year-to-year -year basis for four of the five past quarters. Watch out, iPhone 6 Plus. You're looking kind of small. The Wall Street Journal is also reporting, they're really on a roll today, that Google will release its largest ever smartphone this month. This is according to three people familiar with the situation. The new phone is apparently codenamed Shamu, you know, like the killer whale because it's such a big phone. And will have a 5.9 inch screen, a high resolution display, and be sold under the Nexus brand. Interestingly enough, Motorola Mobility, which is the phone maker that Google is selling to Lenovo, is reportedly manufacturing the phone. Google declined to comment. In 2011, phablets, that's this category of large phone that's can't put in any pant pockets, accounted for about 1% of global smartphone shipments. Not very much. This year, the bigger phones will make up 24% of the market, according to consultants at Strategy Analytics. It's just the way things are going. Thanks, Asia. Security software maker Symantec has announced it's splitting into two companies after a decade-long expansion effort. In a statement, the company explains that its cybersecurity and data storage divisions would become separately publicly traded companies. This should make analysts and investors happy, some of whom have kind of vocally wanted a breakup of the company, which has a market capitalization of $16.2 billion, but whose stock price was being hurt by fusing the high-margin security business with a less profitable storage division. Symantec joins Hewlett Packard and eBay as the latest large tech company to plan a breakup. eBay said on September 30th that it would spin off its PayPal payments unit from its marketplace business. And HP said earlier this week that it would split its personal computer and printers businesses into a separate entity from the corporate hardware and services business. It's all the rage. Got to split your company if you're old. Did Google infringe on Oracle copyright by using Oracle-owned Java APIs in the operating system Android without permission? You know the story. The Oracle versus Google legal case has been dragging on for years with no resolution, but it may be wrapping up as Google has now filed a petition for the U.S. Supreme Court to make a final ruling. Google's argued that the APIs are just a means of working with systems and they shouldn't be copyrighted. Oracle says that its code is an original copyrightable work. Can't come to an agreement on that. After Google won the case in a lower court, an appeals court partially overturned the ruling. That was actually quite controversial. And if the Supreme Court declines to hear the case, then that ruling will stand. Google argues that much of modern tech really has been built around the idea that APIs, those allow programs to communicate across platforms, are openly available. And an Oracle victory could set a precedent that opens the door to other lawsuits. Either way, a response from the court is due on November 7th. Coming up, turning GIFs, yeah, I said GIFs, into videos. Who's going to do it and why? And up next, I'll chat with Zach Whitaker from ZDNet about how some police are getting foiled when smartphones are remotely wiped. But first, let's thank NatureBox for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Right now, NatureBox is giving you a chance, you and your coworkers, your hungry coworkers who have grumbling stomachs, to get a free trial box of their most popular snacks. So, drop the candy bar, drop the potato chips. If you read any of my tweets, you know that I was talking about sugar earlier. You know, you can get really addicted to crappy food. It's not good for you. What you want to do is get delicious, wholesome snacks at naturebox.com. It'll you can satisfy your craving, your sweet tooth, whatever, but you don't have to feel guilty about eating NatureBox snacks because they're better for you. They have zero artificial flavors, colors, sweeteners, zero grams of trans fats. Those are terrible for you. No high fructose corn syrup ever. You can find snacks with no added sugar, uh, dietary restrictions, you know, you're allergic to nuts or gluten or whatever. You, NatureBox has you covered. They've got a lot of different kinds of snacks. So in the afternoon, when you're crashing and you're hungry, 
you want to grab some cashew power clusters from Nature Box or guacamole bites or Italian bistro pretzels. They're all really delicious. You know, they've got sweet and savory. They've, they've, they've really got everything for your palate and they're just better for you than the other snack options out there. Start your free trial today and get a free sampler box at naturebox.com slash twit. Seriously, if you're sitting in an office right now or even at home and you have something bad for you that you're about to take a bite of, please put that, put that down. Put it down. Naturebox.com slash twit. It'll keep you staying full, staying strong, and snacking smarter. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. And thanks to Naturebox for the support of Tech News tonight. All right, joining us now is Zach Whitaker, editor over at Zenidet. And as we were talking about before the show, fellow cat lover. Hello, Zach. Hello, good <laughs> evening from New York. <laughs> Zach and Toby the cat, who's going to and the vet Toby tomorrow. The yes. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, yes. Best of luck in advance. Thank you very much. Neither of us are looking forward to it. I can assure you of that. <laughs> I can uh, I can imagine. I can relate. Uh, you wrote an article today, back to tech for a second, uh, that smartphones being remotely wiped in police custody is kind of causing a rift between encryption versus law enforcement. So what's the story? What's the exactly the story here? Is it that remotely wiping phones is confusing law enforcement? It's not only confusing them, but it's also um, a bit of a new situation for some of these British police forces. So the BBC News reported today that some British police forces are struggling to deal with many modern smartphones, which can be remotely wiped. Uh, the story was somewhat comical because one of the police forces said they don't know how people wiped them. Um, now, of course, we all pretty much know the reason, and that's find my iPhone. And that's just for Apple users. Android, Windows Phone, um, BlackBerry users all have this ability to remotely delete every bit of data on a phone in case it's lost or stolen. And some, the reported figure was six devices in the past year, are also being wiped as soon as they're taken into police custody. The trouble is, if it's confiscated by police, that can, in theory, set back an investigation, um, particularly if there's incriminating evidence on those devices that police might need to see. Well, all right. So, you know, there, there's a history of not just law enforcement, but government officials sometimes not being exactly uh, having their finger on the pulses of the latest technology. But if this is actually something, and we've talked about this quite a bit on TN2 as of late, the idea that there is this divide between, you know, that law enforcement wanting to do the right thing and uh, not being able to access the kind of information that they might need to be able, uh, need to access in order to apprehend thieves or whatever it is. So where do you see this going? I mean, I know this particular story is, 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 is a UK based story, but this yeah. is a widespread problem. Of course. And it also applies very much in the U S and around the world as well. Um, in the last few weeks, we've seen um, Google and Apple um, put down encryption on their latest versions of Android and iOS 8. This is posing a bit of a problem for law enforcement because they claim that kidnappers and, and victims of crime will, you know, will, will all suffer as a result of, of this encryption. Because what happens is that when a police unit or a law enforcement official needs to go and get this information from devices, they will have to go to the device owners themselves and they can't go to companies like Apple and Google anymore. So this is causing a bit of a headache for them, but it's also a response very much in, you know, very much in response to the National Security Agency revelations that we saw and um, first published last year. You know, speaking of that, a colleague of yours, Seth Rosenblatt, wrote an article uh, that the U.S. spying scandal will break the Internet. That is according to Google's uh, Eric Schmidt. Uh, this was uh, something that he said at a roundtable that was held in Palo Alto with other tech leaders. Uh, uh, and yeah, I don't know. It, it, OK, so I guess. You, you know, you mentioned Apple, Google have both said, listen, we're going to offer encryption for our customers because people have a right to privacy. And then our hands are tied. Even if if law enforcement wants to come to us, we cannot do we cannot do anything. Uh, now, of course, I guess eventually the at least in the U.S., the government could put pressure on these companies and force them to change their policies. What, mm -hmm. How do you see this playing out? This one's very much a game of cat and mouse, if you will. Forgive the pun from earlier. Um, because the thing is, the, the NSA revelations have forced um, companies like Google, um, at, even Amazon, Microsoft, all these Silicon Valley giants um, to respond in such a way that they try to preserve their revenue streams, 
They want to make sure that their customers are um, having their privacy rights protected, but at the same time, they're also trying to make their customers happy in that respect as well, and that ultimately affects their bottom lines. So there's going to be a constant back and forth uh, between um, the federal agencies, the Obama administration, people in the White House, and Silicon Valley. Um, for now, I strongly suspect that um, customers are going to respond favorably to this, uh, to the privacy protections that they're offered. But again, it's, it's not, it's not a, a complete solution because even though these companies may not have all of their data, they still have a great deal, especially Google and also Apple. Um, in case of um, iCloud data, that's still available to grab uh, by law enforcement, even though a subpoena or a search warrant might you know, have to be issued. It, Apple still has a lot of data. Google has an awful lot of data. And these companies, a lot of the time, they rely on customer data to make their services better, but also to serve advertisements um, to generate money themselves. How do you see this kind of affecting the global market? Apple, Google, both US-based companies, California-based companies. Uh, I can see a lot of other companies following suit just saying this is something that consumers want. They want a level of protection on a device that they're paying a lot of money for. Why wouldn't we just offer this as long as it's still legal to do so? What about markets Let's say, you know, the Chinese market, huge market, uh, it has a, a very thriving uh, uh, a mar market for uh, devices that are made in that country. I, I can see it going a very different direction. Of course. Now, again, there are a lot of moving parts in this because um, some companies have been de facto barred from operating in the U.S. because there have been claims of, you know, Chinese hackers or the Chinese government attacking, you know, um, US-based networks. Well, this is almost exactly what the US government's been doing um, with some of the NSA's activities. There's a very high chance that, you know, companies like Google and Apple are suffering right now. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the people who suffer. Um, there are some solutions out there, um, such as keeping data in your own country under, you know, your own laws. Um, would that essentially mean the breakup of the internet as we know it? Not so much, but it will cost internet companies um, dearly. And that could reflect on, ultimately, people like you and I. That means free services might not be free anymore. Zach Whitaker is the editor over at ZDNet. Thanks so much for uh, shedding a little bit more light on what is increasingly an interesting dilemma for, Thank you for having law me. enforcement. Before you go, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Um, I'm at ZDNet, CNET, and CBS News. Excellent. Thanks so much, Zach. All right. Finally, we know they're funny. We see them in their our email chains, but they're also clunky. I'm talking about animated GIFs, of course, or GIFs if you want to say it that way. Stop emailing me about it. Photo sharing service Imager, I-M-G-U-R, Imager, thinks that these animated GIFs should be updated for the modern age. In fact, founder of the company, Alan Schaff, explains that the format was created in 1989 and wasn't even created for the purpose of animation. So, quote, what we're trying to do is keep that same experience almost intact, but just make the technology around it much better. Any GIF files uploaded to Imager are now automatically converted to MP4 video and then compressed and then displayed just as a standard GIF would be. However, the conversion to MP4 means that GIFs can now be a lot larger and a lot higher quality, and the resulting files are still smaller than your average GIF. Hey, cool, it's magic. Another advantage to the MP4 format is that the GIF will autoplay at full speed even while it's loading, so that sort of choppy version of a GIF that a lot of us are used to may be on its way out. What's next, flying cars? Not according to Elon Musk. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. That was a, yeah, I, maybe you got that. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News today. The Friday edition starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.